importantly, that particularly affect women. Uh, so we've seen women's safety on the streets uh, still be a real issue with a massive lack of confidence in the police tackling that. Uh, we've seen the horrific rise of domestic violence in the home, uh, particularly pronounced during the lockdowns, uh, but also the pressure on services that many women rely on uh, as the result of cuts over many years. Uh, and now an urgent need to invest in those services. Um, people will probably have seen some of the press coverage about the cost of living, uh, the number of single parents who are disproportionately women, absolutely struggling to make basic ends meet. Now it's no longer heating or eating, it's people not being able to afford to do either. So a lot happening. Uh, what's great about Arise is it doesn't just look at what's gone wrong. It features people who are doing something about it. It talks about how we can all get involved in campaigning and try to take action. Uh, my name's Ruth Hayes. I'm the chair of Labour Women Leading, uh, which is a group for left women in the Labour Party to organise together and campaign. We've got a brilliant panel. I'm really looking forward uh, to hearing them speak. Uh, all of them who are women who are absolutely at the forefront of resisting the Tory offensive. And if you haven't been to an Arise session before, this is part of uh, this is, uh, the fourth event out of a series of 20. Thousands of people have already joined. I haven't caught all of them, but the good thing is because it's online, if you've missed a session, uh, you can uh, catch up afterwards. Uh, I know lots of people you know, will find it hard to combine with work, et cetera. Um, so there are plenty more events. Um, you can get a ticket and the details of how to get a ticket for future events will be uh, posted up on the YouTube channel. Um, and if you would like to donate, that would be amazing. Uh, it does cost money to put on events like this. Um, it, it costs money to keep um, events streamed. And at the moment, as we're seeing a massive rise in the number of COVID infections, and I'm delighted that uh, we've got Joan 12 speaking to us later, um, the need for online content is really high so that we can make sure that people can participate safely. Um, I know times are very difficult for everybody, but even if it's a small contribution, if you can chip in, that would make a real difference. Um, we're going to move to our first speaker. Um, and our first speaker is Holly Turner from NHS Workers Say No. Holly is a nurse. She's a GMB organiser and she's a founder of NHS Workers Say No. And she's going to talk to us about the current state of the NHS. The workforce in nursing is predominantly female. So women are disproportionately affected uh, by low pay and by unsafe working conditions. Uh, the impacts on women's health uh, due to cuts in funding are significant. And she'll also talk about showing solidarity to sisters in the US, uh, linking up to the recent overturning of Roe versus Wade decision. So, Holly, thank you very much for joining us. I know you're going to have to leave us slightly early because you're taking time out of your working day. And that's much appreciated. Over to you. Thanks, Ruth. Um, and thanks for that intro. And as Ruth said, I am a nurse and I'm also an activist. Um, I'm really pleased to be here um, at this important event as part of the Arise Festival, um, which actually happens to fall on the 74th birthday of the NHS, which is today, which marks 74 years of free universal healthcare. However, we're hitting this um, milestone birthday at a time this week when new research has shown us that privatisation along with chronic understaffing, which we're seeing across the NHS, across all services, has been linked to preventable deaths. So as, as with much that is happening in this country, profits are coming above lives and this is a devastating situation which will impact us all. So we need to be uniting in demanding proper funding and no more needless suffering in our health service. And along with that, workers need a proper pay rise and we need to be able to recruit and retain staff. And I'm sure on this NHS birthday, there aren't that many NHS staff who feel like celebrating today. 
we are, you've probably seen some of the news stories, um, week on week, we're seeing more and more food banks opening in hospitals, which are actually being set up for staff who are struggling with the cost of living crisis. And it's not just um, food banks that are opening for staff now, there's clothing banks opening, and also um, welfare and hygiene packs are being set up for staff um, to have access to, which is, which is a dev devastating and I think you'll agree disgraceful situation that our workers in the health service are facing this. Um, and along with the increase in cost for fuels, bills, accommodation, these NHS staff will have been hit by the recent rise in taxes for working people as well. Along with that, we've seen the reintroduction of parking fees, which we know were suspended during the pandemic. And also um, a really important one is NHS staff are still waiting for their annual pay award, which is now over three months late because the government missed their own deadline to submit their evidence. And as a result of this, the lowest paid, so the band two workers in the NHS have had to be given an advance on this year's pay award just so the NHS, star, NHS does not fall foul of minimum wage legislation, which is completely unacceptable. So, you know, because of this and many other things, we're calling for solidarity with healthcare workers whose morale right now is cripplingly low. So across the movement, we're finding ourselves at a time when activists, trade unionists, all of us, we're building for the battle of our lives, many of us, against this, this cruel government who are making repeated attacks on our class. And it's why people are organising across sectors. And, and really, I think we could all agree there's simply no time to waste in pushing back against repeated cuts to our services, increased levels of privatisation, fire and rehire, and so many other assaults on, on us whilst the super rich only continue to increase their wealth. Now, my husband and I are both nurses. We both work throughout the pandemic. We have a young family and I would describe the pandemic as I would describe it as the worst time of our lives. But I do think it's worth highlighting that the health service was in a crisis pre-pandemic. And whilst COVID-19 did place, you know, increased pressure on this dangerously fragile health service, the cracks were there before. And that is down to years and years of Tory neglect which have left us with 100,000 vacancies. We've got tens of thousands of staff off stick. We can't recruit. We've got millions sat on wait, waiting lists and there's an increased level of outsourcing across all services. So the combination of all these factors really have led to NHS staff feeling completely burnt out and demoralized and, and leaving the profession. A lot of surveys are saying that one in three staff want to quit and, and they're leaving all the time and a factor which I think perhaps isn't discussed widely enough is that the workforce is actually 90% women. Now nursing does suffer from a historical construction as a vocation where the workers, usually women, as I've said 90% of nursing staff are women, they enter this as a calling and, and thinking like this does have consequences for us all and this gendered construction of nursing leaves a legacy which only continues to feed this current crisis, which includes this suppression of wages and downgrading of our working conditions. And this notion of the caring vocation really does take away the complex skills which a nurse possesses, and it really does devalue the emotional labour required to do the job and leaves us with this recruitment and retention crisis and also NHS staff being dealt over a decade of real terms cuts to their pay. So on top of being appallingly underpaid, a, substanti a substantial gender pay gap exists amongst healthcare professionals with women receiving an average of 30% less than men per week. And this is why we're organizing because this cannot continue along with the dismantling of our NHS, degrading of its workforce. It's yet another government policy which is disproportionately affecting women and we're uniting and we're saying no more to this. Now internationally we're seeing assaults on women's rights in relation to their health and their body autonomy and it's really important and I want to say we must have international solidarity and support our sisters in America whilst ensuring that we are organised on the left to defend our rights here. Now the ruling against Roe is terrifying and it could whet the rights appetite for reversing other social gains, such as the right to contraception and the laws on consensual sex. 
And what is happening in the UK, it may provoke a right wing reactionary wave. What is happening in the US, sorry, it may provoke a right wing reactionary wave in the UK. And we must be ready to fight back as communities, as activists in our trade unions and as a working class. And I want to say that we should expect that fight back to be supported by the opposition. Now this week, many of you are aware or may not be, but we saw the health and care bill pass, which strips controls from the NHS on decision making boards. And I think it's fair to say, it, it's not far fetched to say that we could see abortion rights for women in the UK being affected, along with services being privatised, privatised, along with even deeper cuts to women's services that we've already seen, such as domestic violence and breastfeeding services, which have already suffered dramatically under the Tories. And this is why we have to fight to defend the NHS and ensure it remains free for all at the point of access and under public ownership and control. The UK politicians, NHS unions should all be condemning what's happening in the US. It needs to be the right of all women to decide if they have children. And on the one hand, this does mean access to contraception, fertility services and sex, sex education. But on the other hand, it does mean ensuring resources are available for childcare, local services, decent housing and a guaranteed income that can enable children to be brought up free from poverty. And there really should be no barriers to this. So in the NHS, workers are awaiting their pay award, which is rumoured to be around 3% again, which is nowhere near the rate of inflation. And then we'll begin the ballot process. And NHS workers, it's fair to say, are being inspired by strikes such as the RMT and the outsourced mighty workers in South London. And we've also seen the recent CWU ballots passing. The public outpouring of support has been incredible and people have had enough and they're united and we are seeing that. The government's outright refusal to pay NHS staff properly will only increase this rate. I've already discussed that people are leaving the NHS and this is a political choice and why we're fighting back against it. By the government not addressing the core issues of inadequate funding, privatisation and not paying staff, they're owed what what they're owed and deserve, it just leaves the door wide open for further destruction and dismantling of our services, which will impact society as a whole at a time when healthcare is unaffordable to the majority of this country. But along with NHS staff, the whole of the UK needs a pay rise. Our colleagues across the public sector face similar cuts to pay and services, and we must work in solidarity to apply pressure to the government. And all at NHS workers say no, offer unconditional solidarity to our sisters and brothers in their industrial struggles, and we will not be divided. Solidarity. Thank you so much. That was fantastic, Holly. And um, I, you know, I myself am a trade unionist and uh, active in a range of campaigns, there was stuff that you covered that I didn't know. And I think we faced a real struggle to get some of the information out about exactly how bad the attacks on our NHS are and why it's really, really vital that we all support you and your comrade colleagues in taking action, uh, ensuring a decent pay rise and ensuring that the NHS remains a public service uh, run for the public good uh, and free for all of us to use. Um, thank you so much. I know that you won't be able to stay until the very end, um, so we may not have the chance to ask you questions, but that was really, really helpful. Uh, and I think the point you made about it, it's a political choice. We've seen the government was able to put money into all sorts of things uh, during the pandemic. It's a political choice about pay. There's been an absence of strategy about uh, how we train people to do public sector jobs and make those jobs secure, well-paid, good jobs, which uh, they should be. So thank you very, very much indeed for that amazing contribution. Um, our next speaker is Donna Guthrie, uh, who is the National Women's Officer for Barrack UK. Uh, Donna is a lifelong anti-racism campaigner and a Unite activist. And uh, it's a pleasure to uh, know Donna through her work in Unite. She's going to talk about Barrack's work in challenging racism and austerity. Uh, and we know that it's not only uh, women in general have been very hard hit by austerity and by the impact of the pandemic. 
but some groups of women have faced particular uh, issues uh, and have been even harder hit. And black women and women of colour are amongst those who've, who've had the very sharpest end of much of what's happening. So, Donna, thank you very much for coming and over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me today to speak about Barrack's work and my work as the National Women's Officer for Barrack. Um, so really to follow on from what Holly's talked about in the discussion previously, the government's austerity measures and cuts to jobs, welfare, public spending and public services has impacted on the most vulnerable in society, black communities, women, the elderly, disabled and young people. Black people have faced increasing inequality. We didn't have a level playing field before austerity started in 2010, and, and definitely not when the pandemic hit, and such as the state of the affairs now with the cost of living crisis. We face inequality in employment, in economic situations with regards to um, you know, our um, wages and um, our incomes with regards to housing, health inequalities, we talk about maternity death rates amongst black women. And um, we also face on top of that, um, relentless systemic racism and racist immigration controls. Black women are impacted much more than most in society and are often concentrated in low paid, part-time and temporary jobs, hardest hit by austerity and now the cost of living crisis, unable to afford these huge price rises that we face. Black women are at least three times more likely to be unemployed compared to their white counterparts. And as we've seen, 12 years of cuts have impacted on our women's services. They've impacted on black women too. So our, our women's centres, our refuges, um, refugees such as Sister Space in Hackney that has had to campaign and fight to stay open. Incomes for women in general has been hammered and black women are facing increased social and economic hardship. The pandemic, as we all saw, exposed racial inequalities in society, with black workers more exposed to COVID on frontline duties and dying at higher rates um, than most, work, most other workers. In inadequate PPE provision, lack of financial support to self-isolate. So many people who were in jobs, in precarious jobs where they had no occupational sick pay entitlement were forced to work when they were sick um, or not isolate um, due to COVID. We remember the global Black Lives Matter protests starting with the murder, you know, initiated by the murder of George Floyd. Um, and that sparked uprisings across the world and renewed calls to eradicate, eradicate racism, discrimination and inequality. Yet two years on, racial inequality continues and the need for change is as present as it was in 2020. We still have to demand that Black Lives Matter. Barracas campaigned since 2010 for racial justice and freedom for black people and for refugees and migrant rights. Our communities have been targeted by the hostile environment of his government and racist immigration laws that have seen the Windrush generation and their descendants targeted for deportation. Back in 2012, Barrack joined with other organisations to launch Movement Against Xenophobia, MAX, the campaign that I think most people will remember you saw um, billboards and posters in train stations across the country, I am an immigrant posters, to highlight the, the wealth of people that have come to this country to, to, you know, to build this country through you know, generations and generations of people. Because we knew that the Immigration Act that was due to be passed in 2014 um, would you know, discriminate against and target new sections of society. We recognise that these immigration changes would bring in a hostile environment that would impact not just on the Windrush generations, but other diaspora, diaspora from the Commonwealth countries across Africa and Asia. People who have come here to settle and been invited to come and rebuild the country were indeed targeted. And we are hearing of, we were hearing of cases back in 2016, and our um, chair of Barrack, um, Zita Holborn, wrote an article in The Guardian. This was two years before the Windrush scandal broke about, and the article was entitled, How Can 50 People Be Snatched From Their Families and Deported to Jamaica? In 2018, the Windrush scandal broke, 
um, following relentless grassroots campaigning, news articles highlighting the testimonies of those affected. And we set up loads of petitions and people got involved um, to demand justice. And yet, three, four years later, after we've had government resignations, Home Office resignations, we've had apologies, we still have people, Windrush generations and their descendants, multiple generations targeted by this government. In 2019, I organised the National Windrush Day action in London. It, this action took place across seven cities in, in the country and I coordinated the London action and we marched from Downing Street and did a massive banner drop across Westminster Bridge. This was to show a strong message to people that although we've got Windrush Day, we've still got injustice for our Windrush victims. Many of those victims actually attended on that day and attended organising meetings in our Unite offices in London to organise to paint the banner and to mark with us on that day. Over 21 people have died without having their Windrush compensation. Um, and the BBC have, the BBC's Freedom of Information request revealed that the average claim takes 14 months to process. 500 Windrush victims are waiting more than a year for compensation. One in five flat applicants um, have so far received payments and they're really low, low offers from the government. So, you know, it's not that, you know, the compensation scheme has eradicated the injustice that people have suffered. In fact, it hasn't. It has almost like worsened people's um, um, situations with regards to like building up hope that they would be recompensed for the injustice and the financial loss that they've had and in fact not giving them anything at all and many people have died through stress um, and are, are failing to come forward to even claim. There's been many um, reports about um, the Windrush lessons learned and recommendations and the Home Office been, have been seen to be guilty of institutional racism and there's been many recommendations but I just want to highlight a few quickly. Um, these recommendations should be implemented by the government. We want the hostile environment scrapped. We need an end to all charter flights, all charter flight deportations, not just to Jamaica but also to all Commonwealth countries, all countries. We need an amnesty for those who came to the UK as children and the government should stop targeting all their descendants. So we want people to get involved, to support the campaigns, to invite barrack speakers to your events. We've spoken at trade union conferences um, and Labour Party meetings and other things up and down the country. We speak at Black Workers TUC. We have stalls at many union events to raise awareness. Please follow Barrack on Twitter, follow us on Instagram and on Facebook as well. But get involved in the campaign, because as we said before, it's only where we can unite together that we can stop this hostile environment and stop the government and bring about justice for all. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Donna. That was um, a brilliant uh, highlighting of the many appalling injustices that are currently taking place. I, I worked um, in a law centre for a long time and honestly, the impact um, of people on finding out that they didn't have the immigration status that they thought they had, they paid tax here for years, they played a key role in often in our public services, only then to find that the government had uh, stripped them of any uh, rights. And it's absolutely shocking that the system that was meant to provide at least some compensation for that has failed so dismally. And um, thank you and everyone at Barrett for the work that you're doing to keep on fighting for justice on that campaign and on others. Uh, and, you know, you've also highlighted the real challenges and, I, you know, it, it picks up on what Holly was saying as well. But the lack of PPE at the start of the pandemic, the disproportionate impact on black workers that that's had, who are often concentrated in those frontline jobs that where people had to keep physically going to work. Um, and we cannot allow uh, that situation to continue. Um, I'm pleased that our next speaker will be perhaps picking up on some of those themes. Uh, our next speaker is Joan Twelves. Uh, Joan is a zero COVID activist from the Zero COVID campaign. Uh, she's a former leader of Lambeth Council, a community activist uh, and a member of Labour Women Leading's Committee. She's going to pick up on the fact that 
contrary to what the government is uh, implying, we are the pandemic is not over. Uh, many of us will have seen in our own networks rates rising very recently, hospitalizations climbing. We're also beginning to see the cumulative impacts of people who are getting COVID uh, many times and who've got long COVID and the abandonment, frankly, of millions at risk. So, Joan, over to you. All right. Thanks very much, Ruth. And thanks to RISE for holding this festival online and not falling for the government's gaslighting and accepting the normalisation of COVID. Sadly, far too many labour movements and other organisations are going along with it, holding in-person conferences and meetings without social distances or facilities for online participation by those not just at high risk of catching COVID, but also carers, those with disabilities and those who have to be at work. For some of us, online meetings have been one of the rare positives which have come out of the past two years. So let's make sure we keep them. Anyway, thanks to RISE for recognising the pandemic is not over. Indeed, we are now in a rising fifth wave of this deadly debilitating virus. The government has tried to get rid of all monitoring programmes and the ONS data we are getting is a week out of date. But even so, we know that nearly 2 million people had COVID last week. That's one in 30 people in England, one in 18 in Scotland. It was a rise of 30% on the previous week, which itself was a, a large rise on the week before that. There's nearly 10,000 people in hospital with COVID. And the idea that we can live with COVID is absolutely absurd. Indeed, it's murderous. COVID is not flu, it's not a cold. Omicron and now its variants BA4 and BA5 are highly contagious and even in its mildest form can lead to long-term illness and incapacity. Reinfections are now becoming commonplace as the virus breaks through antibody and vaccine protections. And the more virus there is in the population, the more likely it is to mutate. And there is there are no guarantees that the next mutations won't be more deadly. Letting it rip, as this government is doing, isn't just making people sick and far more people than needs be, and increasing poverty and hardship for those in precarious jobs with no sick pay, but it is causing untold damage to society, to the economy, to the NHS, to all our public services. We all experience the disruption, unplanned absences and shortages are causing in every aspect of our lives, from sudden cancellations to airport chaos. We're told that five million people have gone missing from the workforce. What we're not told is how that five million breaks down into those who have died from COVID, those who have long COVID and can no longer work or are having to care for relatives with it. Those who have mental health issues following the stress of the pandemic and lockdowns, or the sudden loss of family members and close friends, let alone those who've been forced out of the UK by Brexit and the continuing hostile environment. But the government has washed its hands of all this. It has moved on. Just as it failed to plan for the COVID pandemic or how it was going to end it, you can't turn a society off and then on again like a computer. It has no plans for COVID variants, no new pathogens or future pandemics, which are almost inevitable due to climate change. Indeed, its only plan seems to be to find ways for the workers to pay for the pandemic. I particularly want to talk very quickly about one section of the population the government has most callously washed its hands of, and that is those of us who are classified as being at the highest risk if we catch COVID. Now, when I say this, I know it conjures up an image of an older person, probably in a wheelchair. Yes, older people are at risk, especially if they have other illnesses. And because women live longer, we're going to be a higher proportion of those who are at risk because of age. But uh, the over 4 million people who were classified as clinically extremely vulnerable come from all age groups and are not necessarily those with a disability. I'm a extremely high risk because I'm on immunosuppressant medication. Medication which is given to thousands from every age group who have some form of inflammatory disease in order that we can live active lives. Many people with asthma and respiratory problems, an increasing number because of poor quality air control in the big cities are at high risk. 
So are those like my young neighbor who's a teacher and has sickle cell, those of HIV or diabetes, and those receiving cancer treatments such as chemo and radiotherapy, an increasing number as the NHS tries to play catch up. At the beginning of the pandemic, we were told to shield. For some people that actually meant living in one room, solitary confinement within their family home, but it also meant care packages and various forms of state support and the legal right not to go to work. Now the guidance for people whose immune system means they're at highest risk is, and I'll quote this from the government's guidance papers, we recommend that you avoid meeting with somebody who has tested positive for COVID-19. If you have visitors to your home, ventilate your home by opening windows and doors to let fresh air in and consider asking visitors to exercise precautionary behaviours such as keeping their distance. Tests are no longer free for the general public, but you can ask visitors to take a rapid electoral flow test before visiting you if you wish. You may also consider asking them to wear a face covering and want to wear a face covering yourself. If it feels right for you, if it feels, work from home if you can. If you cannot work from home, speak to your employer about what arrangements they can make to reduce your risk. When out and about, keep social distancing if it feels right to you and consider reducing the time you spend in enclosed, crowded spaces. And consider continuing to wear a face covering in crowded public spaces. In other words, you're on your own. Don't go out, don't socialise, but do risk your life going into an unsafe workplace because you have no, no choice if you're going to earn an income to feed yourself and your family. Your visitors will have to pay for their tests. There's no mention of safer FF2 or three masks, which offer you some protection, or of HEPA air filters to improve your ventilation. I live on a busy main road. If I open windows, it's not fresh air that comes in, it's every pollutant going. Government guide night guidance has no legal standing. Employers can make you go into work. Unscrupulous employers, like Jacob Reed's mog can demand that term civil servants are at their desks, and he is probably less unscrupulous than some. The government has abandoned us. And so is the rest of society. We're invisible. We're locked away and excluded from society like Victorian consumptives. We're ever to live normal lives again, then we have to resist Tory normalisation of an abnormal situation. Our demands are simple. They're not restrictive. They're basic public health measures to protect us and reduce community transmission. They're for masks in public places, including on public transport. They're for free tests again. They're for contact tracing. They're for social distancing and decent sick pay. COVID safe workplaces, enforceable air quality standards, and for long COVID to be classified as a disability, which is not at the moment. Autumn booster vaccinations for all, not just a small section of the population, and proper funding for research and monitoring and the now urgent next generation of vaccines. And for this disgraceful government to support patent waivers so that we can vaccinate the world. And don't forget, obviously, to get all your jabs, including the flu jab, because apparently there's a nasty one on its way in the autumn, along with the sixth wave of COVID. So we're approaching, and I'll finish here, a staggering and tragic landmark, 200,000 deaths in the UK. Why one of the highest pro rata death rates in the world. There's a 200,000 avoidable deaths, 200,000 social murders. We must not forgive and we must not forget. And we must not let this corrupt and callous government get away pretending that the COVID pandemic is over. However much we all wish it's away, it is still with us and it is still killing people. So thanks very much. Um, Thanks, Ruth. I'll finish there. Thank you very much indeed, Joan. And I um, hope that the link to the campaign site will be uh, in the YouTube chat so people can follow up on that. And thank you for a uh, painting such a truthful picture of what's happened. Those deaths were, were many of them 
uh, extremely preventable. And we are not seeing the media tackle the government and hold them to account. We're seeing a lot of stuff about individual events, but the big picture is all those lives that have been lost and people's lives who've been affected uh, through the government's absolutely callous lack of care about what's happening to most of us and that false dichotomy between the economy and health the notion that somehow you could protect people's health or you could protect the economy as if it isn't the work of all of us that contributes to the economy um, and the fact that you cannot build a successful economy uh, on poor public health and uh, poor conditions that some very practical demands there and I think you know for all of us in looking at what we press for at work through our trade unions and in our communities and our local councils some key action points that we can take up there. Um, a quick reminder before we move to our last speaker uh, that you can sign up for uh, tickets for the rest of the Arise Festival. It's brilliant to have so many of you watching us live, and I know that quite a lot of people uh, will be watching later on. Do sign up. The link will be in the YouTube chat to join other events. There's some other fantastic speakers coming up. Um, you, We will have time for just a few questions at the end. If you've got any questions, do put those in the YouTube chat, and we will try and pick some of those up and if you are able to make a donation to the work of Arise uh, that would be brilliant again I understand the links available in the chat it, it it's run entirely by volunteers um, who do an astonishing job uh, but it does cost money to get streaming platforms and uh, etc uh, to publicize things so if you can contribute that would be brilliant um, our final speaker is uh, Milia Pedoma who's uh, on the RMT's executive uh, and has uh, is a campaigner for guards on trains. Um, and I know that many of us will have really benefited uh, from the support and help from guards on trains. And um, they do an absolutely crucial job. And in particular, I think, uh, for women's safety, for disabled women, for women who uh, provide care and support to others and for women with kids. Uh, having somebody, a supportive presence on a train is absolutely invaluable. She's going to talk to us a bit about the RMT's current action. And I think they've done an amazing job of uh, getting support behind them. I know Holly mentioned them earlier. Um, obviously, Mick Lynch has been uh, very articulate in getting their points across. But of course, the RMT is a really diverse union with a lot of members. Um, so it's great to have a woman from the RMT with us. Um, and she's going to talk a bit about the campaign to safeguards uh, and the important for women more generally about trade union action to tackle the cost of living crisis. So thank you very much, Millie, and uh, over to you. Thank you, Ruth, for inviting me to this festival. Um, I've, I've always had a passion uh, for the rights of individuals and became RMT member 32 years when I started my role on the railways in the front line <clears throat> as a ticket examiner, then soon became a guard after six months. Uh, joining as a, a normal member, I soon became an activist and ignited my passion working tirelessly for low paid workers and our members. Now these low paid workers involves um, cleaners as well, not only my grade. Within uh, my region, which is Southeast region, I was the first um, black female to be elected to the um, RMT National Executive Committee. We have 82,000 members in the RMT, 14,000 are females. RMT had female branch secretaries who are organizing their members and supporting reps and members on the ground. Also, RMT had female local and company council representative in all sectors. Over the last few years, we have seen more women 
uh, for petition in the RMT for National Executive Committee. We have had a female president and for the first time in the history of the RMT, we now have a female um, regional organizer and a black woman NEC member, which is myself. Um, we as women have to be part of the change. We have to put ourselves forward. So what <clears throat> can we as women do about it? I will share a quote from Alice Walker, who was the novelist who wrote the color purple and was socialist activist. She said, the common way people give up their right is thinking they don't have any. While this is a step forward, we need to encourage more females to fight for their rights and become activists. For example, most of these companies say they support women with childcare. This is not the case. And even women who are going through the change of life asking to change their shift pattern or requesting PPE face burials. Now to touch on our, um, our mandate for strike action, we have delivered three days effective action. We are receiving massive support from trade unionists and members of the public both across the country and internationally. We are aware that our trade unions, ASLEF, TSSA, GMB, UNITE, and CWEU are either currently balloting their members for strike action or have already won strike mandates. The Tory government want to isolate rail workers and RMT, so they are helpless, like PO workers. We will not let this happen and want to link up with other trade unionists to defeat the Tory pay freeze. Thank you. Thank you so much, Millie. That was great. And um Really fantastic to hear from the RMT. Uh, action uh, coming up as other unions uh, balance. Um, I was very proud to be able to go and visit our local RMT picket lines uh, during the action. And I'm sure many of the people watching will have done. Uh, but we have seen the press try and uh, a suggest you know give very very poor information uh, suggesting it was about drivers whereas actually as you've said uh, the, the action at the moment uh, is for other staff and we really are um, as strong as we are when we support each other no union can win entirely on their own and I think um, understanding how we can support each other uh, will be really key and um, we've got time probably we'll we'll have just like four very quick rounds of questions um unfortunately holly has had to leave us uh she's teaching this afternoon um and at, and joined us from work so unfortunately uh she's had to log off but we've still got three panelists i've got um i've got three questions uh, I'm going to ask them and feel free to answer whichever one you uh, most <laughs> feel is appropriate or that you feel you've got the most to say on. So uh, one is what would you say particularly to women who might be watching this who feel quite isolated um, from what else is going on, uh, feel like there aren't many people that they know that are um, concerned about the same issues, what, what can they do to reduce the isolation and get more involved? Um, 
second question i think the press is talking a lot about the 70s um you know i'm quite old and i was at school during the 70s so one this doesn't actually seem to me to relate to the vast bulk of people but the other thing is that since then the economy and the workforce have really changed and i think what's interesting with the mill has already highlighted some of the unions that are going to ballot at the moment that means we may well see local action at our local schools, at our local post office, at our local station, at our local town hall, rather than taking place in uh, big, you know, big workplaces like large factories, pits, those sorts of things, which, which were more typically where we saw action previously. And how can we show local solidarity? Um, and finally, um, it's tough. I think every speaker has highlighted just the scale um, of what is happening at the moment. And as Donna pointed out, there wasn't a level, level playing field before austerity came in. And since then, things have got uh, tougher for, for many people. What keeps you going? What is it that means you carry on campaigning, you carry on doing work with other people, and you know you don't give up you keep on that battle um and you know i absolutely believe that on many of these things we will be able to win um so uh donna can i go to you first yes you can yeah definitely i mean very good questions definitely i mean i'd love to answer all of them but i'm not going to so but definitely the last <laughs> one i want to give you a couple of anecdotes really because um i didn't get a chance to actually talk about the government's um, new measures with regards to, um, you know, forcibly removing um, and deporting uh, asylum seekers that have come to this country to seek refuge to Rwanda. Um, and I put in the chat, uh, but there are articles, for example, we did an article in the Morning Star, um, Zita Holborn from Barrett did an article um, condemning the government um, for its actions to do that. And um, we had expected the first flight to, to take place and we campaigned tirelessly with lots of other groups. And it, what was fantastic was being able to tweet that no one was on that flight because we had managed to, you know, through legal means and whatever means of campaigning work um, to get everyone off the flight. So, you know, in some, some occasions when we do take action, actually that action does lead to a groundswell of support from the public, of outrage from the public, of people getting more engaged in the campaign work. And it does lead to people um, not facing the injustice that they would have faced. Um, and also in my past experiences as an anti-fascist campaigner, when I used to do anti-BMP work, and the fact that you had in some areas of the country, 12 BMP councillors, um, like in Barking and Dagenham in East London, um, and then the campaigning work that you're involved in and in, in galvanising communities, and you can see the change taking place where people are starting to build up a momentum of action to stop the BMP and to raise the vote in, in opposition to the BMP and the fact that they're able to lose all those seats and the leader of the BMP at that time was able to be defeated is a, is a fantastic thing to be involved in uh, and it does keep you going it's victories like that that do keep you going um, and we need more of them and you know you know more RMT strikes more strikes in general and solidarity with everyone that's taking up the struggle definitely. Brilliant thank you very much Donna. Um, Joan, can we go to you next? Yeah, um, what keeps me going? Anger. <laughs> I just get really angry <clears throat> about all sorts of things. And something like zero COVID campaigning on that is totally self-interest. Um, you know, I've been shielding for two and a half years and I don't want to catch COVID and I've managed to escape it so far. And actually, I will say for somebody, for women who are feeling isolated, what I said at the very beginning of my piece about the need to retain online meetings. I think if you are feeling isolate, isolated, regardless of whether you, you're stuck at home or not, online meetings help you meet women from across the country. And it doesn't mean you've got to go to a meeting and decide you're going to kind of show your face and that's what you're involved in. You can watch things like this. Um, and I'll do a plug that Ruth, I'm sure, will do is... is L Labour women leading do do online meetings. We're going to do some over the summer. So, you know, come along to us uh, on that. Because I think, you know, if you are isolated, particularly if you're at home with small kids and not much money, um, it, it's actually a good way to get to know people because it is very difficult to get to know to me. I got involved in politics 
And I will say, I can remember the 70s. I got involved in politics in the 70s when I was a single parent. And actually, it's very interesting when we talk, and I will talk about this a bit, because people say society has changed. I thought it was bad being a single parent in the 70s. My first involvement, it was in the claimants' union as a claimant. I anger. <laughs> and it's quite interesting because my son, who is quite old nowadays, um, did say to me recently that things that are going on now, he never, there weren't food banks then. You could get some furniture from the church was about the best, you know, most likely thing to happen. You could, you didn't get loans. You got grants from the DHSS and you didn't have to go to work until your child was 16, which is a massive difference in terms of, I was reading that in the paper today, you know, that, that nowadays that you've got to have found a job by the time your child's one. I mean, it's absolutely absurd because that means you've then got to pay childcare costs. Not that there was much childcare around then either. We were fighting for a whole range of women's demands, those that came out of the first women's, Conf women's liberation conferences which were about childcare and about equal pay, still haven't got the equal pay, still haven't got affordable childcare. And if you're in America, you're losing the right to choose. Not that we've actually got the right to choose in this country, but it's a darn sight better than it um, was then. Um, so yeah, the seventies were different on one level and there was far more unionization, of course, in the workforce. But in some areas it wasn't different. It wasn't all large factories and everything else. Some of the major work fights that went on in, in the late 70s and the so-called winter of discontent, those were local authority workers. And local authority workers are still a group which is largely um, unionized, even those who have been contracted out and outsourced are still in the union. And they are doing very, very similar jobs because they are doing public facing jobs. Um, I remember the firefighters went on strike during the 70s. So it wasn't just the miners, and actually most of that was in the 80s. A lot of it was the same groups of workers and it was disparate workers. So yes, differences in lots of ways. And I, I have to say, having talked to Thatcher all the way through the 80s from local government, um, this government is 10 times worse than Thatcher. At least, you, at least Thatcher had, you know, you knew what she was gonna do. <laughs> she had some policies. Um, it was clear cut. Um, and she didn't, apart from Cecil Parkinson, she didn't really allow everybody to go around groping people um, all the time and then deny knowing about it and do it herself. But yeah, it was different, but some things are the same. And actually, I think part of our challenge now is to get more unionisation and to get that solidarity, because we did have solidarity then, and it's so good to see solidarity now. I'll stop there. I could go on forever, as you know, Ruth. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Joan. And Millie, have you got any um, answers to any of those questions? Yeah, um, low cost solidarity, I uh, say so joint trade unions, attend branch meetings, also um, join your trade councils. One of the barriers that we face as women is um, we've got children, so we don't have time after work to do these things, but it's a two-way street, okay? If you can be left at home, you finish work, go home and look after the children, your husband or partner, you go and do whatever they want, you can leave the partner with the children to attend your branch meetings and be an, a, a, a local activist as well. You know, um, and also what keeps me going, um, representing my members, you know, um, keeps me going, you know, um, sitting with the bosses and making sure I get my members out of trouble, get back, get them back to work, put a big smile on my face. That's what keeps me going. Thank you so much, Millie. That's fantastic. Uh, and I was talking to somebody yesterday at a community fridge um, who just escaped from a, a partner who'd been very violent towards her. 
And one of the things she said to me was, you know, I, I did it and I was worried, but my friends have really supported me. And then she said, and now I'm talking to other women about how they can get out as well. And I do think that support for each other through our unions, through our communities, through community campaigning is absolutely vital. And all of us uh, can engage, you know, and for some people that would be at international level, for some people it'd be a national level, for some people it will be, it will feel very small scale, but that quiet culture sometimes of women supporting each other, of uh, making things possible, of making connections, is really important um, and I know through my own work with our local mutual aid that's built some really strong links between people uh, that are new uh, but which are enduring and that sense that we can all as Millie has just said we can all make a difference and do something um, I'd like to thank everybody um, so particularly all our panellists who are incredible women who it's been really inspiring. I've really enjoyed listening to uh, all of your contributions. Um, and I'm sure that all our audience have. A big thank you to all the volunteers uh, at Arise. They're invisible, but uh, they have made this possible. And as Joan was saying, they've done a huge amount to ensure that online activity is accessible to everybody. Um, so thank you. And thank you very much to everybody who's watched us live, who's taken time out of your lunch break, uh, and to all of those who are watching this on the sort of catch up at various other points. Um, do join the rest of the Arise Festival. Do get involved in your trade union. Do get involved in community campaigning. Uh, there is so much to be done, but together we can achieve a huge amount. Thank you very much, everyone, and uh, best wishes for the rest of the day.